Hello and welcome to the Index Fresh Avocado Cultural Seminar Series. My name is Keith Blanchard and this is Seminar 17, Decision Support Tools for Management of Avocado Nutrition. Our first presentation today will be given by Dr. David Crowley from UC Riverside. David Crowley is a professor emeritus in soil microbiology. In 2012, he initiated a five-year project to develop a model that seeks to optimize avocado tree nutrition. What I'd like to tell you about today are the results of the project that we've carried out for the past five years that has looked at refining the nutrition for avocados. And what we have done is uh, look at several thousand trees, well actually several hundred trees, obtaining multiple years over, multiple measurements over years to obtain thousands of data points where we can link the yield to the nutrient levels that are in the tree. And it's a very complex data set. What we're going to be looking at today will involve walking you through some of the different methods that we applied to uh, discern these relationships. And um, it's not going to be a class in statistics or anything, but I think what it's going to do is give you an appreciation of just how noisy these data are and why it has taken so long uh, to get these actual target values. Uh, much of the um, current information that we have on recommendations for avocado are based on citrus. Uh, these were transferred over in 1970 from uh, Tom Imbleton, who was working primarily with citrus at that time. And then uh, these same uh, nutrient levels that were used as guidelines for uh, various citrus crops were good enough to work for avocado initially, and, and they've served pretty well. Uh, the various testing laboratories have since amended those, and you'll see different guidelines depending on the testing laboratory and your, uh, your consultant that's going to have their own personal information. But what we've done that's actually different is we are trying to quantify the relationship. So instead of saying just we have excess fertilizer, what's that actually going to cost you in terms of lost yield? And, and to many people, that, that still comes as somewhat of a surprise because many of us look at fertilization and we bring it up to just the level, we bring it up to the sufficient level and say, well, let's just get a little money in the bank here, let's take it a little further just to make sure there is no problem because some trees are going to be more and some are going to be less, so let's just bring them all up a little more. Well, this is costing you in fertilizer costs, but it's also costing you in lost yield. And so we are able now with the models that we have developed to show you how much that lost yield is, uh, is occurring at different nutrient combinations. So uh, in introducing this work, I also have to acknowledge uh, the California Avocado Commission, uh, which supported this project for five years, a, a very uh, good grant, which enabled us to bring in and assemble a team of uh, faculty and, and researchers. That includes Salvatore Campisi, who uh, was the postdoc who worked on this project for two years. And uh, he is the master of numbers. Uh, we have Julie Escalera, who is uh, just still finishing her PhD, but uh, she's done some nice work on, uh, well, the grower survey that many of you participated in, as well as the effects of hypoxia on chloride toxicity and the uptake of, of chloride by avocado. If you have a wet soil, uh, we have greater problems with salinity and chloride toxicity. Uh, Carol Lovett. Um, a lot of our data comes from uh, Carol's work, which she conducted over uh, 15, 20 years. And she had a huge data set that when we combined her data into our data set, uh, we were able to come up with over 5,000 observations. And that uh, enabled us to complete the project early. It's not uh, initially, we were looking at 2018 and actually uh, provided uh, a time to retire for us because uh, we were able to complete the project. This was my, my final project. So uh, Philippe, a uh, new investigator at uh, UCR, uh, I'm sure you'll be hearing from him. He'd love to be in, more involved with growers on uh, avocado research. And Ariel Dinar, who uh, contributed to the economic uh, analysis and is still uh, very interested in, in further refining these profitability models, but uh, has focused mainly on the cost of water and uh, options for dealing with uh, water deficiencies and declining water quality. So a very good team that we've uh, put together. 
Now, um, before we start talking about nutrition, it's really important to put this into context. Uh, we've been talking uh, over the past few days as we've given these presentations uh, with a number of people who have different input into uh, the project. And in every case, we see that it's very important to recognize that there are many factors that affect production. And often we'll see some 20 to 30 percent of the trees in a grove, they have all the perfect nutrition, but they're not producing. They could be in an alternate bearing mode. It could be a problem with wind or a hot uh, July and, and all the, the fruit starts dropping off. It could be uh, poor pollination or some problem with the salinity, uh, irrigation that you've, uh, your program, if it's not meeting the uh, water requirements. And in fact, the first step that you need to do in optimizing your plant nutrition is to make sure that everything else is as good as you can get it. If you're not irrigating properly, then the soil water status um, is, is down. You have more problems with diffusion of nutrients and you end up with greater nutrient deficiencies. You have problems with root growth, chloride toxicity and salts building up, which means that the roots aren't able to acquire nutrients. So the first step is making sure that you're watering your orchard correctly and then after that, we can begin to optimize your fertilizer uh, program. Now the objectives then the, of this research were to make it a practical tool that all of you can use, a uh, straightforward tool, simple tool that will allow you to look at the effects of nutrients on your yield and help you to make decisions about what fertilizers to use and when to apply uh, these materials. So we started out with a artificial neural network, which uh, is an approach using computer models that can uh, sort out the different variables. And then um, these can be used uh, across a transect of orchards here to look at all the variation. Normally when you're doing this type of uh, program, you would try and set up an experiment with a control and a, a treatment. But in our observations, we wanted to look at all the population and see what was going on with the, um, with the nutrients. Now, a neural network uh, is basically a model where you have all these different mathematical linkages. And these are your various input values of rootstock, soil clay, leaf nitrogen, your various analysis, your water cost. And what we'd like to see is that you could enter in these values of rootstock type that you have your soil texture, the soil pH, uh, these different variables. And then these are mathematically linked through a pattern recognition to give you output and yield, alternate bearing, fruit shelf life, fruit quality, and profit. Now, uh, it is possible to develop these. Uh, there are software now that is used for market analysis, voice recognition, um, stock markets, uh, medical imaging, uh, drones, uh, the military but we don't see neural networks being used in agriculture. And this is one of the areas that uh, have helped to pioneer and uh, we actually, are, the output of our uh, work here is, uh, is a new approach to plant nutrition that could be applied to many different crops. Now, uh, before we go into the different types of uh, approaches and what they show, I think it's important to make sure that we know where we've come from and where we're going and then that gives you a better appreciation. We have uh, the earliest work starting in 1933, and this was at uh, UC Riverside, which is actually the center, the origin of work on plant nutrition and plant analysis. Uh, this work was done uh, on fertilizing avocado groves uh, back before they had chemical fertilizers and before we had analytical techniques that we use today routinely to measure the nutrients in leaves. Uh, we hadn't even determined yet what time of the year to sample or uh, had any information on how to guide our fertilization other than what uh, people learned from practical experience. Now, uh, in 1952, uh, the year I was born, we were looking at uh, nutrient composition and seasonal analysis of avocado trees. So uh, this was a very beginning work in which it was recognized that you have a carryoff of nutrients when you collect your harvest and that this eventually needs to be replenished. The soil is a good reservoir especially if you have a good clay soil and you're introducing organic materials, you have continual inputs. But you also have to account for this depletion of nutrients that's going to occur over time. 
And so that led to the recognition that we need to calculate and include nutrient calculators in our uh, fertigation plans. This is uh, a website that probably most of you have been to. This is Ruben Hofschi's uh, website uh, with avocadosource.com. And it provides a very uh, nice calculator in which you enter in the production value. And it will calculate exactly the amount, well, uh, pretty exactly, but uh, there is room here depending on uh, other factors, the amount of nitrogen that is required, and phosphate, potassium, et cetera, for all the different elements. <clears throat> And um, the main ones that we're concerned with are the macro elements that are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. But there's also uh, considerable uh, interest now in sulfur, which is turning out to be deficient in uh, many orchards, and also in zinc uh, and iron. Iron um, can often uh, mask itself as a zinc deficiency, and they occur together. So these are some of the elements that uh, we're mostly concerned with. The other one would be chloride, uh, which is primarily from a, a toxicity standpoint. But interestingly, one of the results I'm going to show you today is that trees actually respond uh, to chloride at an intermediate level and have slightly higher production uh, when you are at about uh, 0.4 to 0.5 percent chloride, after which it begins to drop off very rapidly. So a little bit of chloride is not bad. I think that's good news. And that was a, a surprise for us in this uh, analytical work. Okay, this one uh, you've seen before for sure. This is Liebig's Law of the Minimum. And I include this here because it's so important to recognize that we have to deal with each of these nutrient deficiencies in a sequence. If you're working with potassium and you have a phosphorus deficiency, uh, as shown here on the slide, uh, this is a phosphorus deficiency. Potassium is not one of these smaller staves here. If you're trying to bring this one up, but phosphate is low, you're not going to see any response to, uh, to the potassium application. Now, what's not shown here is what is the effect of elevating some of these other staves too high. So Liebig's law is pretty good in dealing with deficiencies, but it doesn't tell us about the effects of excess nutrients on yield. And, uh, one of the things that we also have to distinguish is having a vegetative growth versus a yield. Some things will result in very good vegetative growth, but you'll have poor yields. Now, this was recognized early on in 1962, and uh, this is work that was done by Emelton. And I think you'll find the, the uh, results here very interesting in the amounts of nitrogen in the leaves ranging from 1.6 to 2% which uh, at that time was considered to be the optimum for avocado production. Now what happened between now and then? Uh, today, most growers are working up here to 2.2 to 2.4, and we see them going up even to 3.4% nitrogen in the leaves in some of our studies. So um, either Embleton was off in his guess on the uh, optimum level, or uh, we have uh, differences that are occurring now with people recommending more and more applications of nitrogen fertilizers. But clearly you can see the effects here uh, going from some 80 pounds per acre down to 30 pounds per acre uh, as we go from 2 to 2.4% nitrogen. So it was recognized 40 years ago that nutrient excesses are a real problem. And if you are over fertilizing, uh, you're, you're spending a lot of money you don't need to. Uh, you're uh, causing problems with uh, nitrogen leaching and uh, reducing your yields. So getting these targets right is very, very important for profitability. When you look at the uh, variation that occurs over time in an avocado orchard, this is for a single tree. And, uh, and the date uh, of this analysis is 2002, but it goes back to 2008. And you can see over here on the left panel that nitrogen is varying anywhere from 1.8 to 2.4%. And these are color-coded bars which tell you when you're in excess and when you uh, are sufficient and uh, deficient. So <clears throat> uh, this is a very good guideline. But all we have are these bars here that are color-coded. And we really don't have a numerical value for what that's costing you. What does red mean? And these tools that we're trying to implement will give you a quantitative value. So if you're at a certain level, a certain combination of nutrients, what does that 
give you in terms of avocado yield. The other one you can see that's hypervariable here is zinc, which goes from 22 on up to uh, over 200, and then uh, we have all these values in between shifting over time, um, which is uh, uh, havoc for the tree itself in uh, going from deficiencies to uh, excesses. Other nutrients, though, like phosphorus, uh, we see is a very steady state, uh, ranging about 0.15%. Most growers are doing really well with phosphorus, and our soils are not uh, deficient in phosphorus in general. They contain a lot of phosphorus, and you have to replenish some over time, but you don't want to get carried away with any of these elements when you're replenishing. Chloride, uh, you can see, is a, a major problem for this particular tree in this orchard, going up for, uh, to uh, values of 0.8%, where we would predict about a 50% yield loss just caused by the chloride toxicity. But at that level, we're also getting um, changes in the other nutrients because it affects root growth before it affects uh, fruit production. And uh, that means fewer roots, uh, poor nutrition. So dealing with chloride and salinity, again, is, is a critical issue. Now, recently, Carol Lovett has uh, uh, worked with the CDFA to uh, provide some guidelines, and I hope that you're visiting this site. It has some very useful information on uh, all the different uh, crops grown in California. And you can go to this. It's very interactive. You can push on these different buttons and come up with tables and uh, information sources that you can use to uh, learn more about these nutrient levels and uh, what the recommended values are for soil test and leaf analysis and when to conduct these. Probably many of you are familiar with this already, but if you are not, uh, this is a great learning resource. All right, so our research questions. Now let's get into the project itself. How does, uh, let's go back to the original question here. Can we describe mathematical relationships between avocado yield potential and the levels of the different elements? There are some 12 elements, 13 elements actually, uh, that we um, monitor and, and manage. Sulfur is uh, recently on the list. For a long time, sulfur was not uh, in, included in leaf analysis that we uh, were using from Fruit Growers Lab. But it turns out this one is uh, particularly interesting, and we brought this one in with Carol Lovett's work. What are the optimum levels of nutrients that are associated with achieving the highest possible yields? So I'm not talking about promising high yields. I'm talking about maximizing yield potential. So if you get it all right on your yield potential, then you can start working with the other management practices. We want to solve, get the trees in a place where they're going to be uh, capable of producing the best possible crop. You may still have problems. And so again, this is a caveat that you, you may have non-bearing trees that are perfectly optimized, but it's probably for another reason. What are the uh, best fertilizer decisions for achieving optimum profitability? When should they be applied? Uh, typically two weeks after leaf break, we have active root growth. So there's now strategies to, with fertigation to match the nutrients uh, demand to the, to the crop. How does salinity affect this? Do we have a mathematical relationship that we can use? And can we adjust our fertilizer practices to improve avocado yields when we have salty water? The basic answer to that one is improve all the nutrition to the best possible level and, and you can offset some of the losses that would occur with chloride. If you have a chloride problem and you also have nutrient imbalances, chances are your yields are going down to near zero. And uh, can we turn this into a decision support tool? And this is still the open question and you'll hear later from Cliff Omart at Sure Harvest and we're now working with them to uh, develop a practical decision support tool. So there's going to be beta versions coming out in the next year, and uh, we'll need uh, growers or a group of growers to, to give us feedback on is this truly useful. We want something that everybody can access and that will be helpful to you. So uh, we need your input at this point in the project as well. All right, our experiment originally looked at some uh, 12 locations and we had uh, different rootstocks. We had the uh, non-clonal rootstocks. We had uh, uh, Dusa, uh, Toro Canyon, uh, Thomas, which uh, didn't work out so well because of the high salinity problems or uh, sensitivity to salinity. And we carried this out as a transect of the industry going up here to Morro Bay and uh, down here in the Fallbrook area in, in San Diego. So we were again trying to incorporate data that encapsulated all the different um, soil types, management practices, 
The main criteria was that the trees were on a, a standard spacing, 10 to 15 years old when we started the experiment, and so it's a full production uh, orchard. But uh, everything else, we, we opened this up to the growers, uh, practical management tools, and then we look at the overall aggregate of what those nutrient uh, levels in the trees are and which had the best yields. All right, we're going to spend a lot of time on potassium. I'm not going to go through every single element, but uh, we'll highlight potassium and I'll, I'll illustrate some other ones, calcium, magnesium, uh, boron as well, some of the more interesting ones. But this shows you very clearly the problem that we're faced with when we're dealing with trying to model the relationship between yield on the left here in kilograms. Uh, you could double this approximately, uh, this would be about 600 pounds, which would be an extraordinary uh, yield per tree. Uh, most of the trees, though, you see are down here. And, and this is some 3,500 data points. And they're all down here on the bottom. And this is where most of our trees are producing uh, at this level down here. This would be 100 pounds, uh, about 10,000 pounds per acre. But there's a lot of trees that are producing up here. So how do you go through this? And do you draw a regression line? Well, there's no regression that would fit that. It's totally non-predictive. So the first thing you have to do is filter out all these non-bearing trees. And then up at the top, these are most likely in alternate bearing, where you have fluctuations going from near zero to extraordinary yields. And uh, those uh, are chaotic. They introduce a lot of variation into your data set. So those need to be removed. And then uh, we can also sort this out. We used a method called quantile regression, where you uh, take the data that's contained between two points, say 0.5 to 1, and then analyze the, uh, the distribution of the data within that, that range. And you continue on up over the different concentration ranges. So one of the things you might notice, though, if you were just kind of looking at this and saying, well, where is the pattern? You can do what's called an envelope analysis where you try and wrap the data in a curve that describes this function. And you see it comes in here. If we were to do that, the bulk of the data come in at about 0.8% potassium as being the optimum level for the highest yields. But again, there's a lot of noise. So one of the first approaches that we took was to collapse all this. Let's just fold it down and look at yield in a different way. And here's what you get. Uh, <clears throat> all these blue dots that you see are trees that are yielding I say one to 10 pounds of fruit per tree. So they're basically in the non-productive mode. And at lower levels below 0.5% K, uh, you have uh, virtually no production. The yellow and red are illustrating cases where we have five, 600 pounds per tree, and the size of the circle illustrates the yield as well. So they're coordinated there. And you can see it centers at about 0.8% potassium, but it ranges from say 0.7 on up to about 1.2. But as you start going above 1.5, look at all these data points. An occasional tree, probably in alternate bearing mode, that is uh, still high yielding, but everything else is down here non-producing. So if your leaf levels are over 1.5, then it's certain by this probability that you're getting your, most of your trees are yielding very low. And yet, you have to recognize all these are real data points. And as a transect of the industry, carried across north to south, this illustrates that a large number of growers are over fertilizing for potassium. And only uh, probably about 30, 40% of the industry is, is meeting this target where they've maximized yield potential. Now, uh, we can also look at the interactions. And this gets really complicated because if you have even a binary of high and low for each element, and uh, you consider all 12 elements, you get up into 2 to the 12th, you're, you're now into the billions or trillions of co combinations of uh, different elements affecting yield. So this is where um, you have to go through very carefully and sequentially to analyze these interactions. But again, you can see here for phosphorus on this uh, x-axis and the y-axis potassium, 0.8%, we have this zone right in the middle where we see the yellow, the high producing trees, and it centers again here at about 0.15%, 0.14% for phosphorus. And if you are outside of this zone, if you have, even if you have potassium at the right level of 0.8% and you go up to 0.2% phosphorus, you are now in a probability zone where your yields are going to be marginal. 
uh, you've lost a lot of your yield potential. So <clears throat> we can go through on each of these different pairwise combinations, and we have in our final report, uh, we've constructed tables that will let you look at all these pairwise interactions for each element. It's about uh, 15 pages of color-coded tables. So uh, those are there, and we also have those available as a lookup table where we can quantify specific uh, interactions and, and the yield potential that's achieved with those combinations. Some of the other combinations that are interesting, uh, for example, here on the left is uh, we have boron, and we recognize the boron level about 35 parts per million as being the optimum. And uh, you see, again, potassium at 0.8%, this zone right there in the middle. And over here we have uh, potassium versus calcium. Calcium is very, very important. Low levels of calcium is illustrated here. This is going from low to high. All these low levels below 1.5 are primarily associated with low yielding trees. If you bring the levels up to 2% uh, calcium, 1.8 to 2.2, but centering right at about two with 0.8% uh, uh, potassium, then you're in that sweet zone where you're producing, your, or you have the highest yield potential. So you can begin to see that now we can um, pull all these uh, nutrient combinations together to make specific recommendations. Now another way to look at it, I mentioned earlier the quantile regression, and this illustrates some of the same uh, concepts, and here, uh, this is where we're sorting out the data set based on the nutrient levels in the leaves, ranging from a, a low of 0.08%, which I wonder how the tree was even alive, but there are values in that range, and then going on up to 2.4%, 2.5. Each of these different blocks represents uh, some 10% uh, of the industry, so uh, we're having um, uh, many trees over here that are in the non-optimal range. 95% of the trees are right here in the blue boxes, and the red bars illustrate the median value. And it very clearly illustrates here for potassium the maximum median value, uh, about 0.98 to 1% in this case. So each of these methods are giving us slightly different values, and this is part of the challenge. And we apply multiple methods to try and come up with a consensus on exactly where these ranges should be. Now, taking this over to the right here, we can then illustrate the effects on the top producing trees. How many high yielding trees do you have? And here, these are trees that are producing some 10 to 25,000 pounds per acre in the brown and greater than 25,000 pounds per acre in the yellow. And this very clearly shows that between 0.8 to about 0.98, that we have about 20% of our trees. This is a fraction, 80% here, 20% of these are high yielding. And you can see, uh, even going over 10,000 pounds per tree. Half the orchard is now optimized to, for yield potential. At the same time, as you apply more potassium, coming up here to 1.4 and 2.49, you can see you have trees that are non-productive going from 20% to almost 40% of your orchard not producing any fruit. So um, the combination of suppressing high-yielding trees and increasing the number of low-yielding trees is going to bring the, the entire production down for that, that block of trees. So this is looking at it as a probability uh, across the entire population of trees. And we worked with different uh, combinations, different filterings to try and, and sort out uh, these because we wanted to exclude trees that are non-productive and uh, those in alternate bearing. Now, uh, where's the avocado industry poised with respect to potassium? So we look at the sample count in our entire data set and uh, this is where uh, we have different growers reporting these values or the, the information that we obtained. And most everybody, the highest number is actually pretty good. Many growers, the bulk, are right there at the 0.8% uh, value. But all the trees going from, say, here on out, we would consider over-fertilized. And the loss in yield potential here is going from 60 down to some 30 and then dropping off even further. So half your yield potential is lost and about 30% of the industry is now over fertilizing for potassium. Uh, it's both bad news and good news. Uh, that can be corrected. Potassium is going to be depleted and you can eventually uh, bring your levels back down. 
Now, uh, nitrogen, this is uh, one that everybody has been dealing with for decades. And uh, it's very difficult to show a response. And in fact, that's exactly what we found in our analysis as well. The median values uh, are almost um, identical as you go across this range. And oddly enough, um, we, we really don't see uh, much of a growth response to nitrogen, even though it's one of the highest uh, demand nutrients that avocado uh, is, is losing every year with the harvest. But you do see some trends out here at the high end where we begin to lose, uh, in general, we have lower productivity of these high yielding trees. So um, we would optimize at about uh, 2.2% 2. Uh, 2 to 2.2% 2 .2 somewhere in here. And actually, if you think back to Embleton's work at 1.4 uh, up here to 2, uh, you can see probably the range that he suggested was, was fine for avocado at that time, and it'd be fine for avocado at this time. But if you're trying to, to maintain a value, uh, since it doesn't, uh, since you don't want to have a severe deficiency, uh, I would target for in here about 2 to 2.4. And um, that would be uh, where you would also be safe with respect to uh, chloride toxicity and high nitrogen interactions as well. Now, uh, this is for phosphorus, and phosphorus is uh, very interesting. And again, we recognized about 0.15%, but look at the high yielding trees are actually doing much better down here at about 0.13%. And also we have a low number of um, non-producing trees. Uh, we're choosing, a, a, based on other recommendations, that we would uh, like to have about 0.15%, 0.18%. Uh, and that'll, I'll show you that when we get to the uh, neural network analysis. But we also have the envelope analysis, which confirms this. And here, uh, we're wrapping the data set in this slide. And you can see the values uh, peaking here at a slightly over 0.1, the best right there at 0.1. If you're at 0.15, you're OK. But as soon as you start going over 0.15, you're now losing half your production, going down from some 300 kilos per tree down to uh, 100. So you've lost 2 thirds. And then as you go up to the highest levels, you drop off completely. Where's the industry on this? We're uh, most again are, are right here in the red. Uh, they're, they're at this intermediate level. There's some trees down here that are producing more. Um, very few growers are, are having this low level, but they're maintaining this. But over here, over fertilization, you can see this 30% loss. And we have again about a third of the industry with too high phosphorus levels. Now we can model this. This is part of the work that's going to go in the background. We can uh, we derived equations that describe this curve that were actually used to plot this curve, and it's a polynomial equation. So you don't have to deal with this. This will be in the software. The phosphorus value goes in. You enter it, or it comes in from uh, a testing laboratory. Automatically feeds into your program, and um, with that value, you can then see where you are on the scale of productivity. And that should be, hopefully, very useful to you. Uh, calcium and magnesium are uh, especially interesting. I love the pattern. They both agreed with each other. Uh, we know uh, that you need a ratio of about 3 to 1 calcium to magnesium. And you see very clearly the numbers of high-yielding trees are maximized out here at about 1.7 up to about 2% of calcium, but then we begin to see a decline. And you also see an increase in the number of non-producing trees as you go to excess calcium. So we can identify a very clear target range here for calcium. And if you're below that, you could still have some producing trees, but it's not going to be like if you've achieved your maximum uh, uh, yield potential. Magnesium shows the same pattern. Uh, basically, we're looking at, again, 3 to 1 ratio, and, and we can target this value at about 0.6% of uh, magnesium. But you would not want to have a combination of uh, high calcium, uh, low magnesium, or vice versa, because uh, these elements, um, there's research in the literature that shows that these should be maintained at approximately 3 to 1 ratio. Zinc is uh, another one that's really interesting to, uh, to all of us. Uh, this is the element I started working on here 20 years ago. And the data looks about the same then as it does now, ranging from 15 on up to 175 parts per million. Most growers located in this range with some marginal deficiencies occurring at about uh, below 20, and then uh, going up here to about 45. 
but with a very large scatter. And you can see there's a, just a dramatic effect as you go from here, from deficient to increasing the, uh, the levels to this the sufficient level, after which it sort of tails off. And this makes for a very noisy curve, but um, we can look at this data as well in the quantile regression and envelope methods. And here you can see this red bar, that's the median, is maximized at about 70 parts per million of zinc. So this is much higher than what has been uh, suggested in the past. Uh, probably 40 is okay. I mean, there's, it, it depends on how your, all your other nutrients are doing. If, if everything else is right, then your zinc is off, then that would be one that you would definitely want to target to bring it up to this level. And this can be done with uh, chelates or uh, zinc sulfate. Uh, chelates are probably the better approach. One of the things we'd like to include in these tools is uh, when you get a flag on a particular nutrient, it will highlight what are some of the problems that might be management techniques that you can use to get rid of that deficiency. For example, uh, you may want to lower the pH. Iron and zinc are both insoluble at high pH above seven. And even their transport into plant is inhibited in a calcareous soil. So lowering the pH, say with a sulfur burner, may be one of the best ways to uh, increase zinc deficiency as, as a, compared to applying chelates every year. Now, uh, this illustrates uh, for zinc again, the, uh, the same effect here. We're following this bar down and you see at 56, between 56 and 70, this is where we have now maximized the number of high producing trees. And uh, we're still down here with a good number of, of non-producing trees. But a very clear difference with some 20% here of the trees producing at a high level as opposed to 60% as you bring these zinc uh, concentrations up. So this is, I think, a very important guideline for zinc. Sulfur was exciting for us. Um, again, we hadn't monitored sulfur until we brought in uh, Carol Lovett's data set. And uh, this came out in the, from the Grove article. You might have seen this chart before. but. This is where we find the peak yield at 70 kilograms per tree. Uh, tremendous harvest, that's 140, that's like 15,000 pounds per acre. A median value here when sulfur is at 0.53%, as compared to out here where the industry is currently poised at 0.33%. So we need to double the sulfur in the tree in order to maximize the yield potential. And this is again where the industry standard is, or the industry is poised at this level. And the number of people that are out here at the 70 kilogram point, uh, uh, 5% sulfur is really just a small group of growers. So this is one that I think everybody needs to be uh, looking at. I'm hearing uh, anecdotal reports of beautiful looking trees with uh, use of sulfur burners. And uh, we need to follow that up. Um, and and a case, all of the case of this research, um, these are associations, and it's hard to make a clear-cut case always that why is it this value uh, required. But um, this is definitely a signpost, an indicator, that would tell you uh, trees associated with this level have a higher potential. The sulfur burners are uh, relatively inexpensive. Um, there are many manufacturers now, and they burn elemental sulfur. You set it uh, on fire inside this uh, machine and it uh, boils water through it, and you end up with a, a sulfurous acid solution. A 250-gallon tote uh, costs some $2.50 to produce, and uh, that can be carried out to the field and put into your fertigation system and used to lower the pH. Uh, <clears throat> I think this is actually preferable to applying elemental sulfur. Uh, if you're not using fertigation, the other option is just to put elemental sulfur on the soil, but it will take uh, at least a year for that to oxidize and turn into sulfuric acid. So uh, you get a much fine-tuned control with uh, the use of a sulfur burner. The other advantage to this is that uh, the sulfur burner, as it lowers pH, will dissolve calcium. And uh, in effect, what we're doing is producing gypsum, uh, which maintains a higher solubility of calcium in the soil, should boost the calcium uptake in your plant to the levels you're desiring. And calcium uh, in the form of gypsum, well, calcium in general will cause clay soils to, to uh, flocculate, so you get a better soil structure. Your soil should drain better. And uh, this will be many uh, benefits, including physical properties of the soils as well as the tree nutrition. And bringing the pH down also increases iron and zinc availability. So this looks like an extremely useful tool for uh, avocado production. 
Now, chloride toxicity is, is a continual problem. Uh, I think this year we'll be in good luck with the recent rains we've had, and you've washed out all the chloride from the soil, but it's going to come back, and we're dealing with uh, increasing problems with water quality and, and water availability, which means growers would like to irrigate less, and you're in bringing all these salts into the top profile where the roots are, where we need to leach these out and, and keep the chloride levels down. But um, how, how can we now predict the effects of chloride on avocado yields? And this is uh, very interesting. I'll just go to this bottom figure here, which again sorts the industry out. Each of these bars are 10% of the reports that we have. And <clears throat> you can see much of the industry is down here without a problem with chloride, but they're not getting the same yields as those that are out here at about 0.5%, where it appears a little bit of chloride stress is actually promoting the yields, possibly you know, in a similar fashion as what we do with girdling or other types of stresses. But um, we see uh, that there's also some problems in here where as you start going up to this, you may be pushing trees, some trees into being non-productive. It becomes a little bit inconsistent. As you go up to a high level, above 1%, you see a complete shutdown of all the high producing trees. And now you have about 35% of your trees that are non-producing in the orchard. So uh, we can very clearly now describe a line that quantifies the yield losses associated with chloride toxicity. And that's uh, right here. And you can see the envelope analysis uh, is bringing us about 0 0.4 to 0 0.5. But as soon as you go up above 0.6 and start coming down here to 1.4, you now have a complete yield loss. So chloride is a very critical problem for the industry and will be. Now, in terms of the industry status, <clears throat> many growers here, again in red, are fine, are doing well with chloride problems. Uh, but as you go out here, you can see that probably about a third of the industry is again affected by uh, chloride toxicity, and which is causing these reductions. Uh, it, and as you go above 1%, again, dropping off to zero. Now, uh, chloride also has an effect on fruit quality. Uh, as part of this work, Mary Lou Arpaia uh, did a study in which she looked at the uh, calcium uh, percent levels, or we looked at this, and she carried out the fruit ripening study where they went into storage, cold storage, for 30 days. You take them out. And now you're going to look at how much time it takes to ripen. If it ripens right away, it has no shelf life. And so it's already uh, hard to market. By the time it gets to, through the shipping and put on the shelf and the grower looks at it, squeezes it a few times, it's, it's too far. And that's illustrated here on the right axis of fruit days to ripen. Now the best possible uh, situation is you get 10 days of shelf life. And you can see if you're at a low leaf chloride, and a high calcium level up here that the fruit has its maximum shelf life. Now on the other hand, if you bring chloride up to say 0.9, 0 0.7% and you have low calcium in your tree, that fruit has no shelf life. So it could be a future criteria that backing houses might consider as the quality of the fruit or the, local, the uh, size of the market that they can uh, ship to and uh, special handling considerations, et cetera, uh, for dealing with the fruit from uh, different orchards. But one of the ways that we can uh, improve this shelf life in general is to bring up the leaf calcium levels to uh, the 2% value where we have the maximum yield potential and also the best fruit quality. All right, I'm going to now switch to a completely independent approach. You've seen the frontier analysis, the quantile re uh, regressions and so on. Uh, this is using a uh, artificial neural network and we tried uh, some very nice programs which go through and, and separate out all the patterns and, and the uh, different nutrients with, related to yield and it's very powerful but it's also extremely difficult to link it back to Liebig's law of the minimum. Uh, as you start adjusting different nutrients with a neural network you start seeing that things that shouldn't be affecting yield are affecting yield. You, you need to follow this criteria where you address the most limiting nutrient first. Now what this does, I'm going to spend a little bit of time to explain this, is that it's, it's bringing all the elements together so we can see the relationships between them all at once on the same page 
and uh, begin to visually explore how different nutrient combinations affect the yield potential. All right, so um, this then illustrates the um, kilograms here. There's a seri series of panels for kilograms of fruit, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all the different elements. We could have included other uh, things in here like alternate bearing or fruit quality, but we're focusing in this case strictly on the yield. These color bars go from the lowest yield to the highest yield in the data set that was filtered here to remove the alternate bearing or the high yielding, extreme high yielding. And you see all the production, virtually all of it, is concentrated in this corner. So the dark red are, are the high yielding. These are producing in between 60 kilograms. Now let's go over here. What's that associated with? Well, nitrogen, intermediate level of nitrogen. Nitrogen here is ranging um, on up to, to uh, 3%. And as you go here, anything with a high nitrogen level is uh, non-producing in this system. Phosphorus, we see intermediate levels of phosphorus coming in at about 0.15%. Now there's a couple of corners here where you see yields that are still produced, but they represent unusual circumstances associated, for example, with a low uh, potassium, uh, an intermediate level of calcium, high magnesium. So there's certain things that can push uh, yields even if they're non-optimal, but we want to be in this zone that's right here. Uh, chloride, you can see wherever we have high chloride levels, uh, this is associated in a zone here that has, in some cases, a little bit of yield, but mostly in this blue area where we have almost no yield. Potassium, a completely independent approach again, confirming what we saw with the other methods. If you have high potassium, you're over here. There are some circumstances where you get some high yields, but the vast majority of your trees that are uh, producing well are down here into the low to intermediate. So um, this confirms everything that we um, uh, see with the other analysis. Now the chloride effects are also interesting in this and I've illustrated this here. Chloride, you see all the high chloride on this level. We see its effects on phosphorus and nitrogen as well as the yield, so low yields, but it's also associated with low nitrogen, low P in the plant, which is probably related to poor root growth caused by the chloride toxicity. So as we pull chloride out of the picture here and separate out that influence, we see everything converging into this corner with an intermediate level of chloride, almost all of this area shaded here as um, about 0.5% uh, chloride. So it's uh, very comforting to get the, the computer, the artificial intelligence uh, and a pattern recognition model to tell us the same thing we see with conventional statistics. So where are we at now with the industry? Uh, this came out also in the Grove. And uh, what we see is that most of the industry is doing pretty well. If, if you're in this light green, uh, NP and K, uh, most growers are poised right there, but we still have some that are on the outside range. We would uh, like to narrow these ranges. Uh, we'd like to avoid uh, going up to excessive levels of nitrogen. Uh, we're recommending uh, increasing the phosphorus, well, bringing the uh, <clears throat> phosphorus between 0.1 to 0.15. Uh, calcium, right now we see 1.4. This really needs to come up to 1.8 to 2. Uh, zinc, uh, we'd like to see 50 to 80, ideally 70. The highest frequency right now is 34. Manganese, um, we see 75. Um, manganese is an interesting one. We can't really declare it as a case of a deficiency, but if you're watering correctly, then you have an increase in manganese uptake in the plant. And uh, if you go too high in manganese, that indicates that you have uh, probably a hypoxia problem because under low oxygen conditions, manganese converts to a form that's readily taken up. So it's a nice indicator on uh, soil water status as well as uh, a potential for uh, uh, chloride uptake as well. Copper is one here that is very interesting. And uh, I'll take you back to this uh, analysis over here. Uh, copper uh, ranges, uh, what we see is this productive zone. Take it back one more. Uh, <clears throat> so all your high yields, again, right here in the corner. Uh, copper, I can't see it from my angle, right here, is associated almost strictly with an intermediate value of eight parts per million. If you are down here at four parts per million of copper, where many people are, 
then you're in this blue zone right here. So um, this, is, uh, this is a real problem. There's uh, the lowest value in the data set. And you can see these are associated with primarily non-producing trees. There are uh, a few other escapes here, but copper in general is one that we'd like to optimize at about eight parts per million. Now you have to be used a lot of caution in this. Copper at that low level, you, you could exceed it. So if you're applying a lot of copper as copper sulfate or you're putting copper sulfate in your irrigation water to, in a pond, prevent uh, algal growth, uh, this is a potential source of copper for uh, increasing it, but it also could go excessive. So you want to be careful with this. We also have data uh, and a paper coming out now with uh, Carol Lovett and Salvatore where they've used cauliflower stage inflorescences to predict yield. And the most uh, uh, determining element, which was really strange for us, we filtered them all out, uh, the most determinative element was copper. And uh, hitting a, a, a precise level of copper was associated with uh, the highest yields. So there should be some additional analysis tools that we can bring online in the future to guide over the season uh, where you are with uh, nutrition. All right, so uh, I'll just uh, finish up on, on the tables here just to illustrate uh, what we have available in the report. And you can go online, and the CAC will provide a copy of the report. It's uh, about 150 uh, megabytes, so it's not going to be emailed. Uh, but you can go to a Google Dropbox or something like that to require or to acquire the report. And what this shows then are the uh, yield potentials, the highest yield potential in yellow, uh, dropping by 10% increments as you go to orange and uh, brown and then to different shades of blue. And here we're, we're looking at uh, nitrogen uh, uh, versus uh, itself and our different elements. And then over here we have nitrogen versus calcium. All these tables are there. And here you can see copper drilling in right there again at about eight parts per million. And going excess in copper, going less than that is okay uh, to an extent. If you're down here at four, non-productivity. If you're going to an excess, then this is a problem. And you can examine these relationships. And this will be uh, one of the components that we include in the modeling work to uh, have a lookup, a numerical lookup table where we can begin to predict uh, these different uh, combinations and their effect on yield potential. Now, uh, Tim Spann is going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, but uh, <clears throat> this is a sample grower report, and if you bring in all these different elements and you rank them according to the importance of uh, addressing these problems, <clears throat> then uh, you can see those that are causing the greatest loss in this case, the growers reported four parts per million of copper. In our model, the yield potential uh, that you've lost, you've lost your crop. And the next most important problem, you have K deficient at 40% loss. And all these would need to be brought up. Now, it's probably, you'll never get to the point where really worrying about boron at this level of a 5% loss is going to be uh, targeted perfectly. Uh, chances are there will be other elements that you have to address according to Liebig's law well before you get to worrying about optimizing a marginal difference in boron. But by having this numerical relationship, the model should be able to uh, guide you in which elements that you need to address first in your research or in your uh, management. So this is where we are now with the web website development. We have the uh, objectives established. Uh, we are uh, developing uh, spreadsheets and thresholds for action recommendations, how to link this in. Uh, decision trees, this will all go uh, into the software as it's developed this coming year. And we'd like to incorporate interactive tools in there as well, uh, short videos or information or uh, uh, reports, scientific reports that you can go to, uh, that you can click and then link to those, uh, those different uh, uh, topics. And uh, as the program goes, you'll hear from Cliff on uh, how we can use these programs to uh, use the nutrient replacement calculations. We can take into account the nutrient use efficiency based on your soil texture and pH and denitrification potential. And we have in the middle here your adjustment factor, uh, how much you need, uh, what's in the tree already, and uh, what the difference over or under is, and then we can adjust these target levels to uh, get you closer to the uh, desired value. And then that eventually comes over to the total amount that should be applied. And then at the end of the day, we'd also like to have 
the fertilizer requirement based on the in formula and uh, provide some guidance on an application schedule that will maximize the nutrient use efficiency. So uh, it's been uh, a great project for us and I'm really uh, happy with the results and excited about what we've been able to uh, provide for the avocado industry. And I look forward to working with you on, in the future on this. So at this state, in conclusion of uh, my talk, um, we now have decision support tools that are under development. Um, the use of artificial neural networks, quantile regression, envelope analysis now, although each is a little different, but they all are converging on central target values for each of the different nutrients and giving us quantitative values. Uh, we should be able to maximize the yield potential. And um, coming back again to context, good irrigation, leaching practices, managing soil salinity, all this comes equally if not before uh, managing your fertilizer program. So getting everything else is uh, right is, is first. And then you can begin to worry after uh, irrigation, nutrients, uh, pollination, uh, you can start refining the other uh, program to optimize yield potential. So I'll leave it there for uh, questions. Thank you. Yes. Uh The sulfur burner, you're, you're going to be applying, sulfur is going to exist in the soil as sulfate. You can apply it as thiosulfate, which is another way of uh, decreasing the pH it, because it slightly reduces, it oxidizes, it makes uh, uh, sulfate. But in the long run, all your sulfur is going to be in the sulfate form. So gypsum is going to provide both calcium and sulfate. Uh, gypsum is some 300 times more soluble than uh, calcium carbonate lime. So it's an uh, excellent uh, source for uh, upping the calcium and sulfate levels in the, in the plant. And, and more quickly? I don't know. It's, yes, they're both right there, but you're really talking about the amount of material that you're applying. So if, you're, if your sulfur burner is producing a concentrated acid and you don't have too far to go, uh, that's probably one of the faster ways. But uh, gypsum is a good practice uh, to apply to your soil. Well, ideally, yes, but not, not, not yet, because Embleton selected the fall as a time when the leaf nutrient levels were relatively stable. And he could demonstrate that there was some predictive value in using a fall analysis. During the rest of the year, you have nutrients in the, in the tree moving from the roots and the wood, going out to the foliage, transport from the foliage to the flowers. And so we don't have any calibration. We don't know what numbers in other tissues or even in leaf tissue at other times of year would relate to. But now that we have target values, uh, we can begin to see, well, what are the, what's happening in those high yielding trees with a petiole analysis? And ideally, I'd like to see a time when you could take a leaf petiole or a cauliflower stage inflorescence and smash it and put it on a test strip and see where you are with your nutrients and then make an adjustment in your program for fertigation. So it's coming. I think that's the next 20-year uh, project for, for the next person. Well, organic growing uh, is always more challenging. But um, no, it would not make any difference in terms of the nutrients in the, in the plant. They're the same identical molecule. Uh, it's just how they're provided in a chemical form or in a form that needs to be decomposed and slowly released. Organic provides uh, the benefit of having a continual slow release, but it may not always match the phenology of the plant because you put a large amount of compost on at the wrong time, it could introduce salts and high nitrogen and you get a spike. So uh, even organic management has its, its fine points of matching the nutrient uh, application to uh, the crop requirement. But it, it's generally more steady state, slow release. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yes? How many times? Should a leaf analysis be done per year then? Just one time right now because that's all we have calibrated. Uh, if you take it at other times, you're just guessing what it means. Same time every year then? Yes, uh, late September, early October, and try and, and get it at the same time. Even during that time, you're going to see some fluctuations. But in the curve, you look back at Embleton's work, it's right there in the late fall where it plateaus and steadies out and becomes something that you can say, this is what we have now. Does it do any good to do a soils analysis at all? Yes, soils analysis are good, uh, but they need to be done uh, carefully. 
uh, because under an irrigated tree with a mini sprinkler, you're going to have variation going across depending on where the salt fringe is and the amount of water that's delivered and uh, the leaching that occurs in a zone that's, that's heavily leached. It's, we collected soils analysis, but it, it's very difficult. The main benefit of a soil analysis is for salinity assessment and using your salinity pen and coring to see if you're leaching effectively, that's, that's the best tool there. On the other hand, I will say if you do see high levels of a nutrient in the soil and you don't see it in the plant, that tells you there's something wrong with the, the system. You've got a, another problem, probably chloride toxicity. We're, we're beginning that process now. We visited yesterday with one of the testing labs and uh, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, there's a lot of IP issues, I guess, and uh, you know, there, there are recommended ranges and uh, so there, this is something that will be adopted, I'm sure, over time. But they also have uh, beliefs about their, from their own practical experience about these elements. So um, it, I'm sure that there will be a lot of comments on, uh, on what we're doing. Uh, yes, as in all elements. I don't recall exactly what happens at an excess, but it's, it's the same for all nutrients. You, you will reach a point where you've applied too much sulfur. Yes. I, I, I imagine it would be above 1%, but that would just be a ballpark. That would definitely be something to consider. I, I don't know how you'd measure that experimentally in the field, maybe a shaker or uh, something to determine the separation force. But that, uh, that would be an interesting study. If, if someone has a, an orchard with different levels of uh, calcium in the trees and they all uh, are, are coming into ripening, we could probably set up a test to look at something like that to see. Uh, yeah, the fruit, fruit drop question would be really good to, to know about. That's an excellent idea. Uh, I'll suggest that to Philippe. As information comes in, it's now possible to, uh, to separate out the grower name and the orchard from the information and to continually refine this for different rootstocks and soil types and situations, management practices. Uh, all this can be fine-tuned and customized further. So this is the baseline. We've now identified the targets, but we can continue to make this better over the years by growers participating in uh, the decision support tools and allowing their data to be used in a general source, sort of like Google wants to know if you like your program or not. Um, this would be an opportunity to, uh, to bring in thousands of data points uh, that would uh, improve the clarity of the model and, and to confirm what's going on in the future. So uh, that is a great opportunity.